I'd love to introduce to you Victor Wang. Victor, you can join me here on the stage. Victor is an oil, acrylic, and graphite figurative master, born in China and now living in St. Louis, Missouri. He's best known for lavishly colored, thickly textured portraits. He uses the human face as a vehicle to paint human experiences, modeling paints on canvas like a sculpture. In his work, Victor often pulls from his experience during China's cultural revolution, when as a teenager, he was forced to do hard labor with his brothers in the same sunflower fields that they had grown up happily playing in. No stranger to complex emotion, Victor's portraits are a masterclass in emotion and turning your own experience into something incredible. Victor teaches painting, drawing, and graduate critique classes at Font Bern University, where he earned his MFA. He has exhibited internationally, has been honored time and time again for excellence in both painting and art instruction. Welcome, Victor. Thank you, Julie. How are you? Fine, how about you? Very good, thank you. Um, and before we start, I'll uh, also introduce myself. I'm Julie DeBoer. I am a professional artist and one of the founders of Masterius. I do these large flowing, bold uh, landscape paintings in fluid acrylic. And um, yeah, I'm out in Western Canada and this is where Masterius launched and now we're global and growing. So if you are new to Masterius, please feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, and as our members always know, to um, put your questions and comments in the chat there as well. And again, I'll stay on the call after the event to talk more about Masterius, about our community, and to give away a one-month events membership. All right. There we are. So we're going to dive in. Victor. We didn't talk about how to start, but um, my first question, of course, would be a little bit about your story as an artist and your childhood. Um, how can you start there? Yes. Uh, thank you, Julie, for the yeah. opportunity here to my talk pleasure. to my journey of life mm -hmm. to people here and artists. And uh, I was born in a small city in northeast China. Uh, it's very close to the Russian border. Uh, my hometown weather probably closer to the place where you live, Julie, right now. It's very mm -hmm. nice, cool, and during the winter, very cold. And then uh, my mom, my, 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 my father, uh, he's stage actor. Uh, he was a big influencer to me in art and uh, my mom is city librarian mm. and i have five siblings and i'm the youngest one okay. and uh, my when i was young i always go to the theater to see my father's performance on mm. stage and i see lots of interesting light setting mm. composition mm. my father he's a main characters on stage but also his director he always talking to me about how to uh, you know, set up stage like painting, composition, how to group in the people, how mm -hmm. to set up lights, all those things really affect me, uh, influence me a lot uh, after I grow really grown up in art. And uh, after graduate from high school uh, during the Cultural Revolution and all the high school students were sent over by government to the farm in a labor camp, mm -hmm. uh, gone through all the very harsh uh, lifestyle. And then that's affect me a lot. Yeah. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, I think uh, I started to learn draw because I see I'm more uh, fascinated by politic political cartoon on the street. And, uh, and I just started to copy uh, those cartoon uh, and then start to draw uh, to keep my sketchbook. Mm. And uh, so that's the, the way what, what I started in art to start to draw the political cartoon. And, and, and uh, uh, in the la labor camp, uh, I planned the sunflowers too, uh, but it's, especially during the, uh, the daytime, if I'm hungry, uh, I, 
I could not eat well uh, because we, we have lim very limited food yeah. uh, for, 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 the, the, for the young people. Mm -hmm. We have to grow the, the corn and the, uh, the wheat and the sunflower by ourselves. Oh. We, were, we were not farmer. We don't mm -hmm. have any experiences in, in, the, in the field. So that's why uh, you know, we don't have enough food to eat. So sometimes when I was very hungry, I always sneak into sunflower field and then eat mm -hmm. sunflower seeds. Wow. That's just the memory, all the memories. And then also my hometown, my, my uh, home backyard always grow, grow the sunflower. The sunflower has huge, big, uh, could be grown very big head. Yeah. But I'm missing those sunflowers because in the United States, I hardly to see sunflower head really can grow this big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I remember uh, my my brother. I have three brother, one sister. Uh, my brother always, you know, uh, sneak in the sunflower field on backyard, and then we use the sunflower head as helm, and then you know, <laughs> like a shoulder fighting. Oh, funny. Corn. Yeah. In, in, in that. In that field, that's a lot of good memory, but also mm -hmm. bad memory. During the Cultural Revolution, the sunflower become political political symbols mm -hmm. uh, because in nature, sunflower symbolize uh, uh, people, and the sun symbolize a leader mall okay. because in nature, the sunflower always follow the sun facing the uh, facing east uh, in in morning time and then facing west. In sunset time, mm -hmm. and just follow the sun, yeah. uh, which means no matter what, the people has to follow the sun, uh, mm -hmm. has to follow the leader mall. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, it's ironically, you know, when sunflower really become mature, mm -hmm. then they choose one direction and the fall, never follow the sun anymore. Mm -hmm. So that become much more meaningful too uh, in my life. So that's the reason why later. Uh, the sunflower becomes become much more significant symbols in my painting. Okay. But anyway, uh, after uh, after uh, working on on a labor camp for two years and eight months, and the Cultural Revolution is over, mm. I I'm able to I was able to uh, go back to city, and then I passed the very hard uh, big exam to uh, went to. Uh, Acad Lushin Academy of Fine Arts, which is one of three top academy in China. Uh, I graduated from uh, oil painting department, Lushin Academy of Fine Arts. And then I was, after graduation, I was hired as an assistant professor in oil painting department at Lushin Academy. Oh, wow. And then uh, uh, in 1987, my school sent me over to uh, to uh, the School of Art and Design. Uh, University of Urbana Champaign, Illinois, in 1987, as a visiting scholar. Mm. And then uh, after a year, I transferred my status to Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri, as a visiting scholar, continue to uh, study the art education in the United States. I supposed to go back to, to, to China to go, go back to my school to bring those experiences to right. high school teaching. Yeah. And then uh, in 1989, Tiananmen Square events happened. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, a lot uh, of people and freedom, especially young people, uh, college students, looking for Democrats, looking for freedom. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, my government uh, killed lots of people in mm -hmm. the Tiananmen Square. And then that event happened so I could not go back to China. So I decided mm -hmm. I have to stay in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and then I, I, had, uh, I had the MFA degree from uh, Fan Ban University, uh, uh, where right now I'm teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. After I have MFA, I was hired as uh, uh, assistant professor. And then since then, in 1991, since then, I'm, I'm continue teaching at the school yeah. um, until now, so. That's fantastic. That's a lot of, um, lot of years under your belt. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you, you must love teaching. Um, tell me about teaching for you. What's that like? Right. Uh, I think uh, uh, when I just hire in teaching in Lushi Academy, uh, my reputation is pretty good in our teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoy teaching, but also I try to uh, share my experiences based upon what I understand what I have been trained, but also gone through my experiences and then mm -hmm. share with my students. And then uh, uh, since, since teaching at uh, Fangbai University, uh, I, I still continue to share. I think I have more experiences uh, compared to teaching experience in China. Okay. And I got a teaching a year in 1997 uh, at my school, which means, okay. uh, you know, one school only select one uh, teacher in a year, so oh, I, wow. I, I teaching a year award. Oh in, wow! Teaching experiences. Yeah, congratulations. So, thank you, thank you. So, mm. so um, your story is very unique, of course. Um, your childhood and um, yeah, being forced to work in fields with your brothers. What was that? And that was for over two years, almost three years that you had to do that. Um, what was that like? Um, uh, two, two and a half, almost three years. Yeah. Two year and eight, eight months. You know, we very hard, very hard uh, labor ex working experiences. We get up very early, probably 4 30 in mm. the morning. It's very dark. And then just grab some uh, a little eat food with mm. me and then go to the field. And then we, the field is very long. Uh, from this side, I cannot see another end because the earth is oh. her, right? Wow. It's long. You can see all the way to the horizon. Mm. And then go back and forth a couple of times a day. And then come back, the the uh, the sky is dark. Wow. And it's very, very hard. Uh, but I think on the other hand, it really helped me to build up more strength mentally and physically, you know? Mm -hmm. Because I grew up in the city, I know, especially I'm the youngest one. My brother and sister always taking care of everything. I, I do nothing at home. <laughs> but, uh, so it's been uh, in the farm. Uh, that's really. Yeah, that would have been a shocking. A lot about the harshness you can yeah. be in life. Yeah, I'm sure that you are a resilient person because of that experience. And it's hard for us who haven't had an experience like that um, to appreciate how difficult that must have been. So um, tell me about the sunflowers. Um, I, I know when I mentioned earlier that they um, are part of your childhood, good and bad. Um, yeah, tell me about the, the, the feelings and emotions, I guess, around the sunflower and how you use that in your art. Right. The sunflowers, uh, uh, if you know, uh, there's a lot of picture during the Cultural Revolution. You see uh, a lot of propaganda picture about Mao uh, smiling, walking towards, and then the sun behind him, and then yellow sunflower in front. And, uh, and then you see uh, the, on the street, sunflower everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, uh, underneath the, uh, the uh, Mao's statue, uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I think uh, because I have so beautiful memory from the sunflower when I was, was growing up. And then during the Cultural Revolution, sunflower just pulled me to other sides, very mm -hmm. painful side to see the sunflowers. So mm -hmm. sunflower become much more meaningful, especially uh, I was so much influenced by uh, Anselm Kiefer. He did a series of painting of, uh, from uh, uh, some references from the China Cultural Revolution, like okay. Statue of Mao, and then the mm -hmm. black sunflowers, uh, all dead looking. Oh. Uh, it was very, very sad. Uh, and then after I see the Isam Kiefer's, those paintings, the, suddenly I was really inspired. And then I say, that's just, that's just the way really where I grew up, what mm -hmm. where I experiences with about sunflowers. Mm -hmm. 
And then I started to, before I didn't use sunflowers, and then I started to buy the sunflowers and then I start to do a couple of paintings uh, with the sunflowers. And then after that, I start to use the sunflower as symbolic uh, approach um, with a human figure, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, it, and it's a beautiful combination too. Um, I do love that in your work. So, because many of us are growing artists and you have so much um, experience and expertise, how, how do you convey that sadness and joy in a sunflower? Is it something very literal based on the colors and shape and texture, or is it more something that you're pouring in emotionally as you paint? Right. Uh, I think I, I have some images I want to share with everybody. Yeah. Would I? Wonderful. Okay, yeah, so about absolutely. sunflowers. Okay, so uh, probably you can got an idea about why I'm using more dry sunflowers uh, rather than fresh sunflowers. Uh, okay. But, uh, mm. Wow. Beautiful. I haven't seen this one. Okay, so this mm. this is Ashley Kiefer's what I'm talking to. Okay, and then uh, he that uh, the statue mouse statue and the dry uh, grasses and the dead sunflower field. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those uh, idea really inspire me about the sunflowers. Uh, this is what I'm talking to. You know, the mouse oh, yes. symbolizes the sun and the yeah. sunflower in front. Mm -hmm. And then this is uh, Shenyang City, the big statue. Uh -huh. And then you can see the sunflower, yellow sunflowers uh, yeah. underneath. Okay, so this statue, most statue already been destroyed uh, since uh, uh, Cultural Revolution has been uh, criticizing. And then this statue mm -hmm. is still there in the Shenyang City and where Lushan Academy, uh, where I came from. And then, uh, mm -hmm. so this is really, why I see those uh, bring me lots of uh, painful experiences like that because my dad, he was uh, treated as a bad person during the Cultural Revolution. And then uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Red Guard hold him, hold other people, you know, has the name and the name has a title, the bad title on, uh, and then uh, on a prey on the, on the truck. Uh, it's a lot of bad experiences uh, during, during the night mm -hmm. and then the Red Guard uh, it came to my house, my home, and then grabbed my dad away. So it's just so oh, really? just my nightmare, something like this. Uh, and then yeah. this is what, what I started to buy the sunflower and then set up mm -hmm. and then do a little study to got feeling from that. Wow. And I did fresh, very fresh sunflowers. But uh, what I see is since fresh sunflower is very prettier, and then uh, that's probably too pretty. And then I put the dead mask on uh, right here to make uh, something become much more engaging and meaningful uh -huh. rather than just plop, plop, pretty yellow sunflowers. And then later I use mm -hmm. more dead sunflowers uh, and then become much more symbolic way too. And then some yeah. still have a freshness. So, so that's, this is the, the uh, solo show uh, in Oda Wagner Gallery at uh, mm -hmm. Toronto, uh, the Toronto. And, uh, uh, and then I start to paint much bigger. It's bigger mm -hmm. with sunflower. Be because I use the dry sunflowers, I had a little sadness, but also the meanings before, uh, between uh, you know, death and uh, uh, birth and death like those meanings okay. to, to those to be because when I see the flowers uh you know a mixed feelings it's not exactly just the negative way but yeah. also the positive way as as well at the same times so. yeah yeah beautiful yeah it's good I, I always appreciate your photos where you're standing next to it because you can't uh gauge the size in your work is um it's huge, <laughs> very yeah, stunning. 
Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's really powerful uh, seeing the, the dead sunflowers uh, and the mask. And yeah, those definitely convey emotion telling a story. Mm. Um, so as you are, um, I guess, what's your process as you're planning a painting and you're getting into it and, and figuring out what you want to convey emotionally and what the story is uh, that you want to tell? What's that process like for you? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, I have a couple, couple period. Uh, uh, early period, I try to use uh, portraiture or human figure as expressive vehicle in terms of mood and mm -hmm. the feelings too. And then later, I think especially last uh, decade, I start to move on to more little narrative, has more storytelling too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then another significant changes uh, to me, when I was a graduate, uh, in graduate school, uh, my teacher, my sculpture teacher, uh, Rudy Perrin, he's an Italian guy, uh, he studied under, uh, uh, I tried to find a very famous sculptor uh, uh, from Italy. Uh, he's the best friend of Rodin. Rodin. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, my teacher, he's very good. And then he always, uh, uh, I help him. I, I'm, I was his teaching assistant, but also I have helping him uh, sculpture in his studio. And then the sculpture, the way he teach me the sculpture really affect the way what I see the painting. So that's why right now I see I have heavy impasto uh, because those are sculpture experiences. Yeah. Uh, I want to quickly share my, uh, the couple images as well too. About, sure. um, do you feel that the uh, texture adds well what do you what do you feel it adds to your work I guess is what I'm wondering yeah I think the first of all uh, why I see the texture uh because I working on 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 the farm I was working on the farm I always see the dry land mm -hmm. I see the clay I see the texture re remind me the way what I'm working on uh, on the uh on the earth you know mm -hmm. okay so th this this is Rudy Torini, my sculpture teacher. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. And then uh, this is he doing this uh, relief. I always do first layer. That's first layer what I did. Oh. And then he, he make a final touch on the top layer. So mm -hmm. wow. and then he tried to grab me to the sculpt, sculpture major. But uh, I like it, but I, I still, my, I think my passion is still more in painting rather than sculpture. This is my sculpture uh, when I was wow. students. And, uh, but I like the texture, especially, mm. I like those texture marks. I like those marks making. Yeah. I always seem amazed by those marks making. I, try, I was trying to think how to bring those interesting touches to my painting. Yeah. And, uh, and then this is Rodez. Uh, sculpture and then this side, uh, this is Ivan Mastrovic, that's mm -hmm. an uh, Italian painter, an uh, Italian sculptor, best friend, their best friend. Oh, yeah. And then, mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, he he has lots of commission in the United States, you see everywhere. This is a statue on the uh, Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Michigan Avenue, uh, okay. on that, nearby uh, Chicago Art Institute. Mm. And then this comparison, the similar poses, but uh, this is one is Rodin, this one is his, uh, this uh, Mastrovic. Oh, I see. The sculpture is more polished, smooth. Yeah. But I like the Rodin's, it's more clay marks. Uh, yeah. See, like this, the, the face, yeah. beautiful, just, you know, just one clay mark on the forehead. Yeah. That does not mean sculpture, uh, does not mean the structure, but just something. Yeah. Just there, it just looks looks perfect. Mm. So those really inspire me a whole lot more. Mm. So I started to paint, you know, just try to change my setting, you know, try to think maybe I need to treat 
the color as color clay, as sculpture, mm -hmm. and then just modeling. And then I always just use a palette knife to pick up the paints, yeah. and then uh, school school out the paint, and then put on uh, the brush. Rather than use a brush, pick up as you always pick up a little paint. Yeah. And screw up, and then pick uh, put on the paint, on the brush, and then lay down on those mm -hmm. uh, the paints on on the surface. Yeah. So that's really start. I feel it's more sculptural, mm -hmm. clay color clay like. So that's that, that's what I uh, start to have more fun to do it. Yeah. So. Well, and it, it's so um, rich and tangible, like what you said. Um, you want it to be like the earth, that it's yeah. something real and you can touch it and feel it. Right. Um, it's beautiful. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So in this stage, Julie, those that what I'm talking to, I use more of. Uh, a uh, human face and the figure as expressive vehicle in terms mm -hmm. of mood and feeling too. Yeah. Because uh, when I was United States for first 10 years, I was very struggling physically, mentally, uh, everything culturally. You know, I'm a, totally come from different country and all culture differences. You, you, you know what this goes to, you know, uh, try to open mind to accept all things, uh, all mm -hmm. the things to uh, to become uh, accustomed to this new culture. And, uh, and then and then besides my daughter, my wife and I went to United States. Uh, I was United States 1987. My wife was 88. Okay. And then my daughter, she when I left China, my, my daughter was one and a half years old in China with my parents in law. Okay. And, uh, uh, and then we tried to, my wife and I tried to bring my daughter uh, being in the United States. Mm -hmm. the government, my government does not allow to because they they were afraid we were immigrate to the United States rather than go back to China. Okay. We have to okay. have to go back to 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 China. That's supposed to be in policy. Yeah. So my daughter stayed with my parents in law for four years four and a half years wow i i didn't see her my wife and i didn't see her for four years wow until she's six and a half so at that time we were so struggling yeah. we were so struggling not only struggling about physical emotional here but also uh with my uh missing my daughter so yeah. oh, that's, that's a really really tough time Oh, I imagine, yeah. That's, okay. that's just why I tried in that period, I tried to all try to capture, maybe project upon my wife mm -hmm. and my, myself feeling too mm -hmm. with those portraiture. Yeah, do you feel like your work helps you process your pain and the sadness? Yeah. The more I sad, the more I like to stay in the studio. Yeah. The, the, those always turn up, uh, transform to my feeling to the to the art form become much more, much more interesting. Rather mm -hmm. than why I'm feeling so happy, I just want to sit on the couch watch TV. I don't want to go to the studio. <laughs> but why I feel sad, I always want to go to the studio. Yeah. In pain, so mm -hmm. like a uh, like, like a chemotherapy, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh. Art therapy. Art therapy. Uh, yeah. So um, as a teacher in art, is that part of what you're teaching and coaching around? Is the artists uh, learning how to put their emotion and experiences into their work? Uh, we're talking about, you know, uh, I also I teach graduate school, uh, graduate students as well. Okay. In graduate courses, we're talking about you know what's the art? What 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 do you want to share with audience through your hard work? We're talking about you know what's the meanings uh, uh, to doing art. You know, uh, I always share my experiences. My uh, student always keeping question, and then also I share other artists. You know how the artists each artist choosing the, their own idea, and then based upon their experiences, you know, mm -hmm. everything like project upon their personality, their their background, their history, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what sometimes teaching. I like teaching because teaching really helped me to become uh, keep thinking about those issues as well yeah. too. Yeah. 
it out. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Once you start teaching, you uh, have to process uh, and understand your own process and story uh, exactly. to be able to share it well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, for, for artists, uh, the artists here that are watching that are with us today, um, do you think that artists subconsciously or intuitively put their emotions and experience into their work? Or is that something that as a growing artist, we should be really thinking about and pursuing? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I remember a while ago, uh, my teacher uh, tell us about the three major thing uh, being uh, could be success, successful uh, being artist. Uh, the one, number one is ambitious. Mm. Uh, so you have to have big ambitions to be, to become somebody and to be able to motivate yourself to set up the goal and then, you know, working towards to that direction, mm -hmm. whether you reach it or not reach it, but you, you better have a big ambitious. Mm. And then the, the second one is the idea, of course, you know, you have to have something that's more, more unique. You want to share, not just simple beauty, you know, because, you know, right now on Instagram, you can see a lot more technical artists, they're doing the beautiful portrait, beautiful figure, but you don't feel this personality. You don't feel their own experiences. They are just make a pretty picture or pretty, pretty painting. They don't have a very unique angle. Go go into it. So I think that's just, you know you really need to find some unique idea really from your personal angle mm -hmm. to be able to share, and then people can respond to it, can be engaged to it. And then technique, technique. I was trained with more academic training, but after that. I don't want to paint like like academic uh, painter style. Yeah. I want to find something, you know, uh, it's more uh, personal. So that's much more engaging. So that's the reason why why I had a couple show in uh, uh, Arcadia Gallery in New York, and then the art collector uh, like my work because they they like the way what I'm doing. Uh, Technically, it's very unique, very interesting, engaging. So, mm -hmm. so those three things I think are very important. And the plus, keep working hard towards your goal. So that's that thing. Yeah, I love that ambition. I your unique idea and technique. Um, ambition is yeah, absolutely. That's something we don't actually talk a lot about, but you definitely need it if you're going to succeed right. as an artist. Hmm. Tell me about the collage elements in your paintings. Wow. Uh, I have uh, uh, images I want to share with you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is an uh, article in American Artist Magazine, and right now it's no longer exist. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1998, uh, not 98, uh, 19, uh, 2007, yeah, 2007. And uh, uh, so this is uh, the article uh, talking about my idea, but also the technique as well too. So this, the collage, those image is from a Chinese painting, old Chinese painting from Tang Dynasty, uh, about a thousand years ago. So this period, uh, this that's my favorite period, uh, uh, art art period uh, in Chi uh, in in Chinese uh, art. When I was student, I always I always copy those images because the antiquity is very interesting. Uh, the form, line, quality, color, and uh, and the all subject matter is is women, um, but a couple of couple painting has men, but mostly are women, and then uh, because because this this like uh, using the digital imaging, uh, 
uh, paste down on my painting that's become much more uh, signature kind of because I'm a Chinese I train in China and then that's what I learned from a whole lot more from those traditional Chinese art and then I always paste down uh, before I start to working on the color and then that's the way what I pasted uh, first to no order just in random and then after that, I draw the line, repeating the images from, uh, sometimes repeating from the images, uh, the collage, sometimes just other images over with the mm -hmm. line. And then after that, I seal it with, because this is uh, acrylic, a gesso, and okay. I seal the surface with oil, mm -hmm. with this color. And then after that, I sketch, I sketch. Uh -huh. And then uh, after sketch, do a little uh, that later study for the basic form. And then after that, I start to build up the lights, okay, uh, layer of lights. So that's that's way to keep building up, building up. Uh, so even though I have very thick application on the lights, I always keep more transparent and uh, uh, more transparent application on the shadow and on the background to be able to allow those clouds come through. Otherwise, if I use all opaque, it's going to cover them all. But mm -hmm. also what I like, especially the opaque color, more advanced and then transparent color, more receding. I always like those special relationship in traditions. So, and then I just keep building up, building up, building up. So this is end. So this is final. Mm. Yeah. You can mm -hmm. see, still see the little images, but the, uh, from digital, it's hard to. But if you see standing in front of painting, you see this little figure here, there, yeah. on the transparent area. And then mm -hmm. the image is probably hard to see, but on the arm, you see mm -hmm. the tiny figure hidden here, there. Mm -hmm. But on the lights, very thick, opaque. But uh, on the shadow, it's all tr more transparent on the background. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh, I really appreciate you sharing that process. I had, I did not know that. Of course, I've only seen your work digitally. I don't know that I ever would have uh, found the layers under the the painting and the story that you're telling there. That's remarkable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well. Folks, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. There's a comment, uh, Judy says, I'm wondering why there hasn't been a documentary on Victor. This is so very fascinating. Has anyone done a documentary on your life, Victor? <laughs> no, 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 yet. I hope, I, I wish, so we will see. But, but I have a, a, a two podcast, a podcast uh, interview, so that's okay. it. Okay, well, and this one will be a podcast too. Um, where can we see your work in person? Where is it? I have a three gallery so far now. Uh, before I have five gallery. Right now, uh, I have three. Mm -hmm. uh, at uh, Oda Wagner Gallery in Toronto. Toronto. Canada. Awesome. Great. And then, uh, uh, art, uh, no, uh, Victor, Victor, art, Hold on. Uh, I, I don't know how to spell spelling his last name. Where is it located? Uh, Chicago. Uh, Victor uh, Ar Armand Armand Darius. Armand okay. Darius. Victor okay. Armand Darius. Uh, and then my local gallery. And then my local gallery, uh, doing Reed Gallery, St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, tell us about a day in the life for you, Victor. Yeah, I teach uh, four four classes a week. Right now, I'm in summer break. It's it's a heavenly time for myself to stay in my studio mm. for three months. And uh, but during the the regular semester, I teach four classes. Uh, in general, Tuesday, Thursday. At uh, Tuesday, Thursday, I work in the morning time because my class is on the afternoon and the evening. And then uh, Monday, Wednesday, uh, I work in 
Monday, Wednesday, I don't working because I have morning uh, time classes. And then uh, the evening, I always get more tired, exhausting because mm -hmm. I don't paint on the afternoon. I always paint, evening, paint on the evening. Oh, okay. The Friday, uh, I don't have a class. That's called studio day. Uh, teacher and the students stay in uh, our studio. So mm -hmm. I have a whole day Friday to paint in my studio. And then Saturday, I always paint a uh, whole day. And then Sunday, if my wife does not shopping, uh, I have to go with her. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> other than that, I can paint another half day, so. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, love it. I'm, I'm glad that uh, you teach. I think you have obviously um, a lot of good to bring to the art world and the more people that hear your story, the better. That's fantastic. And I'm glad that you have time to paint, obviously. <laughs> your work is amazing. Uh, a really great question from Shelley. What recommendations do you have for beginning artists to find their style or voice? Uh, I, I think, uh, the first of all, in the beginning, uh, you probably, you, you will see most artists always has the hero or is the, the artist inspire them, mm -hmm. no matter what. You could simply just like, like this artist and then, and then take, borrow the technique or the way to paint from this artist. Mm -hmm. And then after you become much more familiar with the materials, the way the paints, you, know, you have something on your hand, you can start experimenting by yourself. Okay. Like what I got this uh, uh, more experimenting, uh, uh, this the way what I like, because one day I, I, I was so frustrated. I, I keep working, working on one piece, never turned out the, the way what I like. And then lots of paint left over on the palette. Uh, and then I just school with the, the, all those, uh, the paints, a big chunk. Uh, with the palette that, and then threw on the canvas. Suddenly I see those physicality, beautiful, uh, the color mixing, I mix all yeah. the things. I suddenly, oh, this is what I really want to go, you know, pursue this the way to apply paints. So, yeah, yeah. so you, you, you have to, you know, the people talking about when you're not, when you're not strong, you always rely on the approach. Okay, when you become uh, strong and then you can, through the crotch or a crotch. So that's just the way, you know, uh, you serve it. You always see the artist, oh, this is a very good painter. You can see the influencing in the beginning from mm -hmm. some artists. So that's just a better mm -hmm. way to build up uh, quickly from the beginning. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, my connection might be a little bit poor. Sorry if I'm choppy. Uh, I, so that's great because that master is we're all learning from master artists. Yeah. It's good to know that, yeah, we definitely, copying is a really important part of learning and then it becomes a crutch and then we need to get rid of it and right. start pursuing our own right. unique style. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but you um, have to have something in, on your hand rather than you just take so long to build up by yourself. You know, uh, 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 who said yeah, the, the Newton, talking to the famous phrase because he reaching high because he's standing on master master shoulder so which means yeah. eye on and then you build up upon from there as much faster and quicker so. mm. mm -hmm. um what advice do you have aside from you know finding your style and voice what advice do you have for growing artists um, something that you learned that you wish you knew early on. Uh, I think uh, find some uh, some mentor. I think some sometimes help because mm -hmm. uh, when I was students, uh, uh, I had one teacher I so admired because she always gave more challenging. Uh, more uh, pushing us more has more critical thinking uh, mm -hmm. rather than just sharing technique or something like that. So make them make me think a lot. So when I was student in the United States, I found my university. I met uh, a professor, and he really pushed me 
to think about what's what's art all about. Uh, before I never think about I just always think oh, I I I can paint. I can uh, I'm technically are very good. I never think what you're going to use for the missiles technique for. Uh, I think find a good mentor really help you to build up mentally for for you. So uh, besides mm -hmm. all those ambitious uh, idea or technique, find if you if you could find the mentor really help you to build up. Uh, you know, thoughtfully. That's that's really helpful. So. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for saying that. And to the audience, no, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you can be mentored by Victor Wang and Masters, by the way, and there is room in his group. But yeah, you're right. Uh, mentorship changed my career completely. Um, I was I was self-taught for seven years and I was doing fine. I was gallery represented, but I hadn't it wasn't until I learned from a master and learned proper technique and composition and then had him mentor me for years that um, that art really became a joy and a, a process in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it really made a difference for me. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, another question from Roberta. Uh, she's interested in your color palettes. They seem very analogous. Uh, uh, I use the color, it's pretty limited color palette, uh, not uh, I, I saw, I would admire uh, some artists can have a, some artists, the palette, so many colorful color, you know, because I like a color too. But I, if I have so many color, I kind of lost. Mm. I can handle too many colors. So my color, I believe still relatively more uh, limited color palette. Okay, so, uh, but I clean out my palette already. So the color, what I use, I use flake white. Uh, I use flake white, okay. which is a light white. Okay, most uh, most artists know uh, titanium white or mm -hmm. zinc white. And the flake white, because it's hard to find right now at, at market. So okay. uh, flake white is light white. Uh, that's an old master uh, always used. Um, before 18th century, the artists always use light white instead of other white. Titanium white after 19th century, and then the titanium white start to become more popular until now. And then because the toxic uh, flake white, so, uh, and then uh, uh, a lot of countries, uh, you know, uh, restricted those flake white uh, seller. So, and then, Especially now, uh, you can see lots of flake white, like uh, the, the, the manufacturer is called flake white hue or flake white sub substitute. So this is not flake white, that's really titanium white, but uh, try to mimic flake white texture because flake white is more buttery quality. And then if you buy them from manufactured white, it's always seems so liquidy. Uh, if you want to build up the texture like uh, the way what I like to, uh, it's really hard. So, and uh, what I always do, uh, either use flake white, or if I cannot find flake white, I, I almost run out of flake white, and then harder to find flake white. Okay. I always use uh, either substitute or hue, flake white hue, and then I squeeze out the paints on the on the yellow pages, the uh, yellow pages, uh, the phone book, okay. And then spread, spread out very thin layers, of the white, mm -hmm. and then let the white sit on the paper uh, three, two or three days. Uh -huh. And the paper soak out all the oil and then yeah. become more buttery quality. It's just like mm -hmm. Rembrandt Studio, they always grinding the paints with more buttery quality. Okay. Uh, but you cannot uh, find any, any paints similar as those quality because they are grinding by the hands. They know the, uh, you know how much oil in, into it. Most manufacturers add too much oil in the tube oh. to, to uh, dry up before sell. So mm -hmm. I soak out those uh, excessive oil and then it has a white. And then I have a, uh, a cadmium yellow medium. 
yellow mm -hmm. ochre, burnt sienna, a uh, burnt amber, uh, that's a sweet brown color, and then a uh, vermilion, this is uh, red, and, and then a listen crimson, and uh, ultramarine blue. I think that's it. Sometimes I use a prussian blue, sometimes I use ultramarine blue. So, mm -hmm. and then, but what I find uh, to be use limited color palette relatively, but still looks more colorful because I use more simultaneous contrast. For mm -hmm. example, like uh, uh, warm versus cool, uh, red versus green, uh, uh, mm -hmm. orange, uh, yellow uh, uh, versus uh, a purple, or something like that. So, yeah. and, and uh, those simultaneous contrasts really make a color more colorful. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, and it looks like you're mixing it on your canvas, uh, not so much on your palette. Is that right? Right. Right. Yeah. So I use. Uh, I always teach my students because my students sometimes attempt to mixing color too much on the on on the palette, and the color become bad. I say try to mix in color, maybe just twenty percent on the palette, and then eighty percent on the canvas. So that way you will see some unmix mix well. So it has more interesting fresh energy. Yeah. So those things. Yeah, eye candy, I call it. Um, we have a few minutes left. Is there oh. anything you want to share that we haven't talked about that I haven't asked yet? No. No, I, I don't re I don't recall. <laughs> Unless someone has specific question too. Yeah, yeah. No, I think we got most of the questions. If and if you have any more questions, folks, uh, put them in the chat. Um, and just a reminder that oh. when we're, yep. I want to quickly, so maybe uh, my later two uh, two pieces. So that's what I'm talking to. I move on, gradually move on to more storytelling. Oh yeah. Uh, so. And just a reminder folks, I'll stay on the call afterwards for those who wanna learn about masters and how to work with Victor. Beautiful, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, this, this one. So mm -hmm. those are my later works. Uh, I, I said I move on to more story, mm -hmm. storytelling, more narrative. And uh, so like uh, you can see uh, uh, something going on. Yeah. And then this is like a little goddess figure. And then those, uh, the horse rider, yeah. uh, you can see very realistic. And then gradually walking towards a more flat humanity mm -hmm. world. Uh, I try to uh, just make interesting uh, the contrast between reality and uh, illusionary or imaginative uh, dreamlike world. Mm -hmm. So, so those are my new 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 works, new mm -hmm. pieces. But also like uh, you know, very thin wash, dripping, yeah. uh, unfinished process uh, versus finished process, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and technically, I, I start to use more uh, opaque and then after opaque overlapping to more semi-transparent, transparent over, uh, so you can see it more like something mm -hmm. like those. That's what I didn't use it before. And uh, and uh, even even this this one, uh, so you can see uh, wow. this the emotional physical struggling for freedom. Yeah. And then this the hunter, this ancient Chinese hunter, tried oh. to hunt him down. Wow. And then the Western hunter you not know, try to hunt him down. Mm -hmm. And then this is uh, like. Uh, uh, dietetic, uh, no, uh, dialectic elements on this reverse this, this little narrative uh, uh, kind of storytelling too. Yeah. It's, it's a oh, process. Wow. So there's a process that. there. Oh, that's so great to see. Yeah. And then this one, uh, you can see the story as well too, like yeah. you know, wounded shoulder. And yeah. then this ancient Chinese warrior Mm -hmm. yeah. so. so good and then this is battle uh, like a battle I'm mixing the time from history to the present time 
for the better thing. Uh, wow. and, uh, so those are my new works. Uh, that's more narrow, moving on more narrow too. And then this one, what I really like because uh, I see the 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 the, the history or history a lot like Rubens, uh, Titian, or other painter always paint the battlefield, but all sharp edges freezing in the motion. It's oh. kind of just like a camera reaction. Yeah. But what I like to what I want to paint the battle still in the motion, you know, yeah. everything in the motion rather than freeze the freeze of the motion. So. Yeah. Well, you do that so well. There's so much movement happening. It's explosive. Wow. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, one last question, and then we'll call her quits. Um, about simultaneous contrast is a term that you used about when yes. you're putting, painting down. The simultaneous contrast are just like more illusionary elements. Okay. So a lot of painters, uh, especially beginner, does not use that well, but some good painter always use that well, which means if you see my face, uh, uh, let me see, uh, good, good, good example, uh, for, for example, if you see my shoulder on this side, okay, mm -hmm. and then uh, if you squint your eye, you can see this, uh, this little halo, look like a little halo light around, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So if a good painter, uh, I, more experienced painter, they always paint this, my shoulder is darker and then makes this halo stronger because when you see, uh, when you see those, like uh, if you see this, I have some good example for my class, a, a circle black paper. If I put on the wall, you mm -hmm. see the glow, like a glow yeah. around it. Yeah. If right. I take the paper away, there's no glow yeah. because simultaneous contract to create this glow. Okay. Yeah. So, if if I do little uh, the little uh, square paper cut a circle, and then put on the wall white wall, and then you see this uh, cut off the circle as glow around, so that's called simultaneous contract to make something uh, has emphasize the glow stronger than no mm -hmm. glow at all, and then color too. When you put very light color on on the dark dark color, okay. And then you see the pop up because simultaneous can much, much stronger. And mm. yet, if you make an even lighter, stronger uh, color around this light color, this color becomes darker. And then uh, this color even pushing to the darker side. Okay. And then if, if a yellow, if you have a yellow color, if you use stronger blue, this yellow color even become much more yellow. Mm. If it's very neutralized brown, you could make more yellow if you use even very bright yellow next to each other. So that's called simultaneous contrast. Wow. They push the value, push the value towards the more extreme side and mm -hmm. the color push color towards more extreme side. So when you paint, if you make, you see little contrast, if you make it stronger simultaneously, you will see the color and the value scale become much more exciting. Mm. You, because there's no time, I could give you lots of good example from the paper. <laughs> but uh, that's just the that's okay. called simultaneous contrast. So. Okay, wonderful. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I've seen seen that often yeah. uh, outside when you're you see things have halos. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing, and thank you so much for your time, Victor. What a pleasure this has been. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, so thank you. I appreciate your openness and um, letting us dive into your life. It's, it's a really um, great fortune thank for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.